things are gonna get crazy. <laughs> Most everyone's mad. <laughs>「Hello there you beautiful people and welcome to another very exciting round of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast and boy do I have some amazing things in store for you all. In fact with this episode it's gonna get real spicy and when I say spicy I'm just gonna go and say right now this could be a bit of a trigger warning that this might end up getting a bit controversial. Or at least with the first few stories that I have in store. There's going to be a lot of major topics that we are going to get into. But don't you worry folks. Even though it might get a bit controversial. It might get a little bit spicy. It's certainly going to be a lot of fun. So this is just my little way of just threatening you all with a good time. And you guys know me. Whenever I would have a good time it really is going to get crazy especially when it's live, especially when it's right here at Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. So, let's not waste any more time. I would like to go into the chat wall and hopefully, uh, by the way, I hope you are all doing fine and I hope you are all set. And I would just like to know, are you all ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Let me hear it. Are you guys all set now? Okay, let's see now. Uh, according to the chat wall, it seems that people are prepared. It looks uh, pretty good. Uh, yep, yeah, people are set. People are anticipating themselves. People are ready. That is great to hear. So, ready or not, folks, we are now gonna go and get this one started. And with our first round of news today with the story, oh man, I actually got a bit of a collection of news because uh, it accumulated pretty quickly, I must say. And this is, however, a story that we have all heard of before, but it seems to be the popular trend of 2020, where movie studios, instead of releasing their movies, they decided to do delays yes we got more delays coming at ya and the first major uh, major delay that we got is going to be with the upcoming christopher nolan movie tenet now the big thing with tenet is that originally it was supposed to be coming out in mid-august so it was supposed to be in a few weeks but warner brothers decided to ultimately go and pull it out of its schedule and right now we do not have an official release date yet for tenet they kept pushing it back and back to the point that they decided to give up and just wait and see if things can get better with the pandemic so that they could properly go and release it. In fact, I even got a quote here on my source here on Variety coming from Warner Brothers in which they have stated, Warner Brothers is committed to bringing Tenet to audiences in theaters on the big screen where exhibitors are ready and public health officials say it's time. In this moment, what we need to be is flexible and we are not treating this as a traditional movie release we are choosing to open the movie midweek to allow audiences to discover the film in their own time and we plan to play longer over an extended play period far beyond the norm to develop a very different yet successful release strategy so in a way you could say that they're planning to treat this a little bit like uh, what Fox did many years ago with Avatar where they kept it on the big screen for quite a long time like even to the point where they released the uh, Blu-ray and the DVD even when it was still in theaters. But wait, hold on a sec, folks. It's not just Tenet, though, because other studios decided to go and follow suit. We got one minor little delay coming from Sony Pictures, where they decided to go and move their third Marvel Cinematic Universe Spider-Man movie, in which originally it was supposed to be coming out on November 5th, 2021, but now they decided to go and push it a bit back to December 17th, 2021. Hopefully they could go and recreate the success that they had with Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. But wait, hold on a sec, there is more. That's just a little bit of a small crumb of a piece of news. 
uh, we also got another one that decided to go and delay their movies, but not just that, not only delay it, but also make a few more schedulings while they are way ahead. And who I'm talking about is going to be regarding Paramount Pictures. Now, in this case here, Paramount Pictures had a couple of big movies that they wanted to go and release. More specifically, A Quiet Place 2 and Top Gun Maverick. A Quiet Place 2 was supposed to be coming out this Labor Day, but unfortunately they decided to go and move it way further ahead, in which now that is going to be released on April 23rd, 2021. And then there is another movie that they got, Top Gun Maverick, the sequel to the cult classic Top Gun. That one was supposed to be a summer movie, we were supposed to have that by now, but ultimately, uh, they ended up uh, delaying it to a Christmas release. But now, that is even changed once again. I guess since it was originally intended as a summer movie, it should stay as a summer movie, in which Paramount decided to delay it again, where now it's going to be coming out on July 2nd, 2021. But like I said, they didn't just do delays, they have also done some new scheduling as well, and they have scheduled all the way to 2023, and a lot of them are actually their animated films, by the way. Uh, instead, uh, it is actually said here that apparently they've also delayed their Jackass movie, which was supposed to be for July 2nd, 2021, but now that release date has been given to Top Gun Maverick, so now they gotta push it to September 3rd of that year. They have also scheduled the sequel to Sonic the Hedgehog, in which now that one is going to be released on April 8th, 2022. Meanwhile, for a couple of their animated films, uh, Paramount Animations Under the Boardwalk is now officially going to be coming out on July 22nd, 2022. And uh, The Tiger's Apprentice, which is going to be a collaboration between Paramount and Skydance Animation, in which that one is going to be scheduled all the way down to February 10th, 2023. Now, that seems to be a lot of delays and a lot of schedule removals, but none can compare to what Disney has done because they've pretty much done as much as all three of these combined and even more. With the big thing is that they have also decided to remove the Mulan remake from their schedule because uh, just like with Tenet, Mulan was supposed to be coming out later in August, not on August 12th, but I believe on August 21st. Uh, but what happened was that Disney ultimately decided to pull it out of his schedule and did not give it a new release date. And nowadays, rumors are starting to spread around that now it seems like there is a strong possibility that Mulan might end up in the same fate as Hamilton, where it could end up getting released on uh, Disney Plus instead of the big screen. In fact, there is a little quote here I have coming from my source here on Deadline from Disney themselves saying, over the last few months, it's becoming clear that nothing can be set in stone when it comes to how we release films during this global health crisis. And today, that means pausing our release plans for Mulan as we assess how we can most effectively bring this film to audiences around the world. But oh wait, there's more. That's not even their biggest movie that they decided to do a massive delay on because apparently they also decided to go and make a little adjustment to their entire decade. And I'm talking about the Star Wars movies and the Avatar sequels where they took all those movies and decided to delay it by a whole year where now the Avatar sequels are going to be coming out. Uh, and by the way, uh, each of these movies are going to be released during mid-December, so these are all going to be at the end of their respective years. So anyways, going back uh, with the Avatar sequels, now they are officially going to be released in 2022, 2024, 2026, and 2028. Meanwhile, we got a set of three Star Wars movies that are going to be released in between those. That was the original plan, and that's still going forward, where now those movies are going to be released in 2023, 2025, and 2027. Meanwhile, we also got a whole bunch of other delays as well. Uh, Death of the Nile had a minor delay, where now it's going to be from October 9th to uh, October 23rd, so that's just a delay of two weeks. Then we also got The Empty Man, which was supposed to be coming out this year on December 4th, but now will be moved to August 7th of next year, I believe. 
Uh, then we also got a movie called Antlers, which now is going to be moved to next year on February 19th. Uh, and then we got The Last Duel by Ridley Scott, and that one was supposed to be coming out this year. That seems to be like some kind of big Oscar contender or like a big competitor in the award season. Uh, it was supposed to have a limited Christmas release and then a wide release uh, for January of 2021, but that has been moved all the way down to October 15th of next year. And there are also a few other really, uh, a few other schedule changes as well, but those are from movies that do not have an official release date yet. But at the same time, there is also one more film I almost forgot to mention, and that is actually regarding The French Dispatch. And that is actually the next Wes Anderson movie, which unfortunately ended up with the same fate as Mulan. It was supposed to be coming out on October 16th, but Disney ultimately decided to pull it away from its, uh, pull it out of its schedule and not give it a new release date yet. So, I know that is quite a mouthful, but uh, that's essentially the major plan that they have. And, uh, well, all of all of what the studios have as well. Oh, and by the way, one more thing. If you guys are concerned about some of the other movies, uh, it has stated here that many of the other ones, uh, like many of the anticipated uh, ones as well, like The King's Man or The New Mutants or Pixar's Soul and stuff like that, uh, and also Black Widow as well, those ones so far have remained untouched. They are still planned on their respective release date, so ultimately we'll just have to wait and see on those if Disney would ever decide to, to, to change that, but those are the ones that have been remained untouched during these big changes. So as you can pretty much tell, it's pretty much official. Now with both Mulan and Tenet out of the way, 2020 has been left with no summer blockbusters. We do not have a summer lineup anymore. It's like all gone. No big movies for the summer. No point of going to the big screen to watch a movie other than like maybe seeing a film that you've already seen before since they are putting out movies that have been released like in the past few years and stuff like that. But that seems to be the big thing. And there is no secret as to why they are doing it. And that is because of the pandemic. Now, of course, I know that there are several places around the world, most places around the world, that have already went through their first wave. There are some that are concerningly getting into their second wave where the numbers are creepily rising a little bit. Uh, since I am from Canada, I can speak for myself that we are starting to see a concerning amount of numbers that are, are, that are starting to slowly grow after we had our first massive wave. Uh, but so far, we have managed to flatten the curve. But it's not really most of the other, uh, other countries that is a major problem with the pandemic. The real issue is regarding the United States. They did not have a second wave. They did not flatten the curve. In fact, things are getting much worse, where now the numbers just kept going higher and higher and higher. It's honestly ridiculous at this point how the United States are handling it and how poorly that they are handling it, I might add, where there was a time that they used to average around like 20 to 30,000 a day, and that was considered se uh, very severe back then. But nowadays, they're starting to average out around 60 or even 70 cases, uh, 70,000 cases a day. And yeah, and like previously, like 20,000 to 30,000 and stuff like that. But you know what I mean, like around 60 to 70,000 cases per day. And there are some states where they are getting it much harder than others, especially with states like California, Texas, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, and the list goes on. It's been getting so bad and so out of hand, and yet you see many of these Republican politicians that are doing absolutely nothing about it, or that there are some that want to do something about it, but unfortunately, they really can't. There's like a lot of bigger forces that are just preventing them from actually doing something to make sure that they could keep their citizens safe. 
And as you could tell, honestly, I don't blame them. I don't blame the movie studios for doing what they have to do, especially with Warner Brothers and Disney delaying many of their movies that they really have to go and push it back and even take away the releases of Tenet and Mulan because things are going so bad in the United States, mainly because of the fact that they don't want to be held accountable for making things worse with the virus because they know how Americans can be. They know that Americans are at a point, well, I'm not, and by the way, I'm not speaking uh, about all Americans, but they know that a good chunk of Americans are very much desperate to put things back to normal, that they want things to be back to normal, like how things used to be before the virus absolutely hit like they've gone desperate to the point that they want to force themselves to be back to normal even with the virus going around and if there is someone who has been infected well sucks to be them they just want to continue living their lives as it was normally where they don't have to wear masks that they don't have to wear social distancing and that they could go wherever they want and they know very well, like Warner Brothers and Disney know very well that with their movies, if they put it out on the big screen, that they are going to be desperate to go and see it. That they're not going to care to go and practice social distancing. They're not going to care to wear their masks. They just want to go and see a major blockbuster and do something that they haven't done in months, which is to go see a major movie on the big screen. And they don't want to be held accountable for that because they know that's just just gonna make things worse and it's going to cause more cases remember last week when i talked about walt disney world and how that reopened and the amount of backlash that they've been getting they don't want to get that on their end they would much rather sacrifice millions of dollars than to be held accountable for making the virus worse bad pr is a massive nightmare to deal with and they are more than willing to just wait things out and probably uh lose a few millions along the way it's a it's a price to pay but for the long run it'll be worth it to have a bit of a good image to show that they do care about their people and that they do not want to make things worse with the virus that's pretty much the big thing that they want to go and emphasize and why and the big question is why is it that i'm targeting the united states specifically like why not some of the other uh countries around the world because it's not the united states that are going through massive hell currently there are plenty of others as well like brazil russia india and plenty of others as well that currently they are being hit massively hard in this case well the reason why I'm targeting specifically the United States because of all these delays is mainly because of the fact that the United States is one of, if not the most important country in order to really capitalize on a movie success. Well, like if you think about the uh, box office numbers, if you think about the earnings that movies and studios would get at the box office, a huge chunk of the money that they would get is from the domestic box office, which is a combination of the United States and Canada. And the US, they certainly pay big bucks for it like they are more than willing to go and spend all the money that's necessary to go and watch the movie in their own form of comfort and the huge amount of profits that they would get is from the United States. And plus the fact that at the domestic box office, that's where they would get a bigger cut of the pay. Where they would say that um, for the domestic box office, studios would get half of the cut uh, where the other half would go to theaters. Whereas internationally, they only get a third of the cut or approximately a third of the cut. Uh, it does vary from country to country, but generally it is about a third for international releases. So as you can imagine, America is a very important country when it comes to the business side of it in order to gain massive earnings. And yes, technically, um, it is true that if uh, Warner Brothers or Disney would go and actually release their movies, if they would release Tenet, if they would release Mulan, I think I can guarantee you that with how desperate people are in order to go out, in order to break some of the rules of uh, COVID-19 to, you know, like they don't want to stay at home, they don't want to do social distancing and stuff like that, these people are absolutely desperate 
to go out and like for sure they would have they would be major hits like if they put them out right now they would be like billion dollar hits but they don't want to be responsible for making things worse with the virus because they know with movie theaters it would be way too easy to spread it and they know that people are not going to be always wearing their masks even if uh, some cinemas are saying that it's mandatory for you to go and wear a mask to check out the films especially if they're going to go and buy like their popcorn and their soda soda and stuff like that it's going to be a very dangerous place especially during this time especially for a pandemic and again like it's going to be a massive PR nightmare to go through even if they stick to their guns and make that decision to put it out on the big screen they know that they're going to get massive backlash regardless in the same way that Disney got last week with the with the reopening of Walt Disney World so they want to make sure they avoid that and of course as you can see with the more delays that are going to be happening the more that it's going to affect um, the the long run as well because as you can see, especially with Disney, it's not just like the movies of 2020 that are being affected. It's not just that a lot of the films of 2020 are going to be moved to 2021. This is also affecting many of the other films that has gone throughout this whole decade where now the Avatar films have been delayed by a whole year and now they're going to go up to 2028. And then we also got plenty of other films uh, that have been rescheduled to go up to even like 2022 or even 2023 like we, like it's a massive domino effect with these movie delays and ultimately uh, when, when, it, when it comes to this like I, I know that it may seem wrong uh to go and like point someone uh to blame in all this but it, it's pretty much like what i said last week when talking about COVID 19 if there are people that are legitimately responsible for what's happening right now if there are people to blame in terms of of COVID-19 in terms of like what's happening right now and all these movie delays and the fact that we are not going to get films like Tenet or Mulan in August, then really the people to blame is the Trump administration, Republican, uh, Republican politicians, idiotic, ignorant people that refuse to follow uh, social distancing rules and that does include uh, anti-mask people. And the thing is, as I said before last week, like these people just do not care about the virus itself. They are desperate to put things back to normal. And instead of trying to combat it, they only make things worse by forcing their way to make things back to normal. They rather want to sweep everything under the rug. They rather want to try to hide the facts. They rather ignore it, pretend that it's not there, and just go on with their daily lives, which is why the United States is still so desperately hellbent to go and try to reopen schools. And that is why I do believe that if you think things are going bad in the United States right now, wait until the school reopenings. Holy crap, as you guys know, if there's one group of people that know very well how to spread germs and viruses, it's kids. And lots of kids don't really understand the concepts of stuff like always wearing a mask or social distancing and stuff. For the most part, these kids don't care because, well, they're kids, especially like toddlers and kindergartners and like kids under the age of like seven or six even. Like, they're just going to go rampant and, you know, like, they're going to be asymptomatic everywhere they go and they'll end up infecting people that they didn't expect that they would infect. So it, it, it will definitely be worse, which is why you see many reports nowadays that in the United States, it is very much possible that it could end up getting um, 100,000 cases per day and it's only going to make things worse and you could definitely tell that in terms of uh, the trump administration and with republican politicians that they don't care they don't want to do anything about it they just want to lie to the public and say that oh everything is going well while literally doing nothing about it while forcing businesses to stay open and to keep them open because they care so much more about the economy than the health and safety of others because after all it is the party that delusionally believes that uh medicare and healthcare is not a human right
And by the way, you know what's funny about this? Because uh, ever since I have done many of these comments in my uh, podcast so far, the, the funny thing is that I have actually been getting some comments, uh, mainly on YouTube, of people that are getting upset at me because I made those comments, and they want to try to get away from that. Like, they, they want the excuses to go away from the stuff that I've mentioned because of anti-mask people, because of Trump, and because of Republican politicians are the reasons why COVID has hit America the hardest. And I, I've seen plenty of excuses. Like I, like, I remember one comment someone mentioned, well, what about people's jobs? What about their jobs? Don't you forget people who have jobs, they need to get back to work. They can't just stay at home all the time because they need a salary. Well, in that case, that is a, it's just like what I said last week with the Disney World reopening. In that aspect, that is the, rep the responsibility of the people's respective companies that they work for. And if not them, then it's the responsibility of either the federal government or the state government. They are the ones that are responsible to ensure that their employers and their uh, citizens remain safe during this time while they still have a livable wage. It's up to them in order to make sure that they are they are safe, that they remain safe at home, that they are healthy, and that they don't end up remain homeless, and that they don't have, um, you know, that they don't have uh, uh, a sal that that well no not 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 that they don't have a salary that they must ensure that they have a salary so that they they don't remain homeless and that they would be like thousands of dollars in debt. It really does, like, if there's one thing that the coronavirus really does go to show, it's that the capital, this current capitalist system is extremely flawed and it cannot function during this uh, kind of crisis. And it really does go to show that it, there needs to be a serious reform with the capitalist system that America has right now and even in some parts around the world that do share that kind of system. Oh, but then recently, I also do have another comment as well. Uh, like, so, uh, like, I think it's probably from that same person who mentioned, Oh, well, you know, another reason is because uh, America is the third most populated country in the world. Did you forget that? Okay, now, technically, it is true that several factors would be accounted to why America is the most infected country in the world that also has the most amount of deaths due to the coronavirus. However, just because it is the third most populated country, that is not the main reason why it is the most infected country in the world. Case in point, take a look at China, the country that is said to be the origin of the virus itself. Now, you met, now the thing is with China is that technically it is the most populated country in the world where it actually has about a billion more people than the United States in its population. And yet, do you know how many cases that they got? 85,000. Not 8.5 million, not 850,000, not 850,000, but just 85,000 reported cases. They have been taking this very seriously. And again, this is the country of origin that they, uh, that happened to have the coronavirus. And from there, they, like, they take it very seriously, and yeah, they were extremely strict about it, but it does bet they did benefit from it from having very low numbers so far. And even nowadays, they are still being extremely careful about it. And another example, to go even further, take a look at India. Now, India, technically, yes, it is one of the hardest hit countries as well, uh, as bad, again, as the United States, as um, Brazil, as Russia, and stuff like that. But even at that, even though India's population is about, is like more than three times bigger than the United States, they actually have uh, less than three, uh, actually three times, more than three times less of infected cases than the United States. And even though their numbers are going high, it's not going as high as the United States. 
So that's the big thing. Yes, there are several factors that could go into why the United States is going so bad, but the biggest reason, the number one cause, is because of the ignorance of the Trump administration, of the Republican governors, and because of people who refuse to follow social distancing guidelines or to follow health and safety guidelines like wearing a mask because these people are somehow way too scared of putting a piece of cloth over their face. And if you're not going, if you refuse to believe that is the main reason and you want to pin the blame on something else, then you're a part of the problem. You're one of those ignorant people that refuse to look into the facts and look into the truth because you don't like the facts. You don't like the truth. You don't like that the main reason is because the Trump administration and Republican politicians are doing such a horrible job at handling the virus to the point that they just gave up and decided to sweep it all under the rug and pretend that it's just not there so that's the big thing those are the people that should be responsible for all these delays and the more that they keep on doing this if more stays the same right now then the more that you got to keep used to seeing all this the more that you gotta use to you gotta get used to seeing more of these delays and chances are if this continues if less of this if more of this continues then chances are many of the movies during the fall they're not going to be released this year chances are they're either going to be moved to a streaming service or they're going to be delayed to 2021 it would not surprise me at all that if this continues and the numbers get even worse in the united states then we're not going to have movies like black widow or pixar soul or um, new mutants or whatever coming out in uh, 2020 like those are going to be delayed as well or they just might end up being moved to a streaming service like either netflix or disney plus and i'm just going to make a prediction right now now of course this is just like several months ahead but i'm just going to say this and this is this is just a little crazy prediction i would not be surprised if sony pictures animation would take connected and they're just going to skip theaters and put it out in premium video on demand because so far, that has been going extremely well for Trolls World Tour and Scoob. And plus the fact that Spongebob has now done it as well. So it wouldn't surprise me if Sony would want to go and jump on the bandwagon and go and release their feature as well. That, or they would go and delay their lineup as well. Because they have several movies uh, coming soon as well. Not just connected, but also with Vivo and Hotel Transylvania 4 and stuff. That they're just going to take all those movies and heavily delay that i would not be surprised if sony would go and decided to take connected out of its release schedule rather it be uh to put it out in premium video on demand so people would watch it at home or that they would go and delay it that's just a little bit of my prediction so really overall the big message is if you guys are sick and tired of all these movie delays if you guys are sick and tired of seeing films like Tenet and Mulan being continuously pushed back or seeing movies like A Quiet Place 2 and Top Gun Maverick being pushed to 2021 then please Follow social, follow the health and safety guidelines. You must wear a mask every time you go out of the house. You must frequently wash your hands. And you must, you must practice social distancing. And even if you go and hang out with your friends, make sure that the amount is at a minimum and that you go and stay outside. Do whatever you can in order to make sure that you do your part in order to minimize the damage of the coronavirus because clearly a lot of them are not doing so and they should absolutely be condemned if they refuse to go and wear a mask if they think if they want to complain and pull out their bullcrap reason of my body and my choice then they should be scolded they should be condemned they should be treated like criminals mainly because they are so scared to wear a piece of cloth in their face like, for some reason, they have this phobia of doing so. Seriously, folks. You need to follow social distancing guidelines. You need to follow all these rules. You must go and wear a mask. You must make it mandatory every time you go out of the house. No matter what. So that's the thing. If you're tired of these movie delays, then follow the health and safety guidelines. If not, then you should be held accountable for having these movies be delayed.
Okay. So, oh, stay out. Well, okay, yeah, and some people say, um, stay, like, are kind of confused about, like, stay outside and stuff. Well, I mean, like, if you want to do social gatherings, then, like, keep yourself, like, keep yourselves outside of it and not indoors and stuff. Uh, that, like, of course, like, stay at home, like, whenever, whenever possible, but that, 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 like, the stay outside thing only applies to, like, social gatherings. But anyways, with that said, let us go into the chat wall right now, and I want to go... And uh, ask you all about your thoughts about the numerous of movie delays. I want to know how you feel about this. I want to know how you feel about the fact that we're not going to get Tenet or Mulan in August. And how many of these movies have been heavily pushed back to 2021 and so far and so forth. Let me know what you all think. Okay. Uh, let's see what we got here. In regards to the schedule, I don't blame the studios um, to either delay or remove their films from the schedule considering the way America, especially in the White House, had poorly handled the situation with the pandemic. The only thing that got me excited is the Sonic sequel having a release date. As a resident in California, I'm not angry or frustrated. I'm just disappointed with not only the state, but with the country. You have let me down massively. Yeah, you know, uh... <laughs> It, it, it is understandable why nowadays um, being a patriotic American is not viewed as a good thing. Okay, so uh, let's see what else we got here. I'm really praying. Uh, I'm really praying that later in 2020 we don't go through more delays again. Um, it's becoming a real big trend around here, and I'm not surprised. All I could say is, if all if y'all are hyped for these movies, my advice: be patient. They will come out. We just gotta stay strong. We can't control the government or how the virus ends or starts. I wish y'all in the Uni in the USA and other places the best of luck, and I wish you the best uh, the best of safety in Canada, Animat. God bless y'all. Hey, thanks, dude. And by the way, just an additional thing to add is that technically, yes, there is one way that this could immediately end, and that is if a vaccine is created and if it is available to people all around the world for free, like no charging bullcrap that you got to go and give vaccines to everyone so that we can go and defeat the virus. That is one way. However, we don't know when that's going to happen. There's no way to say when this will end. We don't know when this is this will happen that things can officially get back to normal. Some people think that it, it like this, some people still have the mentality that somehow this is like a flu and that this would magically go away, that the, somehow this will magically disappear even if um it'll magically disappear even if uh, even long before the vaccine would be created which is not true it is going to stick like honestly one thing that i can't say for sure is that it will definitely stick around as long it, it will definitely stick around as long as people don't follow uh the health and safety guidelines like yeah the, like there are many places where the numbers are are low but that's because many of those places are actually taking it seriously where they are have it, where they do have laws where they would have mandatory masks where they would have laws that you must follow uh social distancing and all that kind of stuff so that's the thing. We don't know when this is going to end. So we have to do our best in order to minimize the damage in the meantime before we can officially have a vaccine uh, to be created. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, we have a lot of cases in the United States and flu season. And I think all of us are thinking Seoul might be on Disney Plus or delayed to next year, maybe February because of Black History Month and Valentine's Day and my birthday month, which is the day before Valentine's Day. And what Jake Paul has done throwing a party. Okay, someone went on a rant about Jake Paul, but uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's just Jake Paul being an idiot and eventually, yeah, he's going to catch it if he continues like that. So I'm not going to be sympathetic to him when he catches it. I guess is what he deserves for all those years of stupidity. Anyways, um, you know, I can think of one way that uh, all ha all have could have been avoided wearing a damn mask. But seriously, all this really does sting uh, as a film buff. But it's entirely understandable in the long run. But I, I sure can't wait until the pandemic ends to check out New Mutants on the fifth of Never uh, Neveruary. <laughs> 
But no, that's the thing, though, is that apparently Disney is still sticking to their guns, and they're saying that um, with the New Mutants, they're still keeping it on its release of the end of August. Now, of course, rumors are speculating again that they might go and change that and just put it on Disney Plus once and for all, but uh, I don't know. You, you never know, man. Uh, let's see. What else do we got here? Uh, what, what other comments would we have? Uh, well, this is surprising to no one, I'm sure. In terms of delays for Disney, I'm not that surprised that Mulan got delayed. However, I am shocked that the delayed stuff like Avatar and Star Wars. However, I'm still questioning if they decided to delay this stuff, then uh, why did they not put the new, new Mutants on video on demand and keep it at the end of August in theaters and have it inevitably get delayed for the 5,000th time? I guess for some of these things, Disney is still sticking to their guns. I guess there are still some elements that Disney is in a bit of a wait and see kind of attitude because technically with um, with the New Mutants, it is a month away and it is still a bit of a long time and you never know if things could actually change. So Disney is still, you know, I believe Disney is still sticking to their guns on those films, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're going to announce uh, some more delays or they might put some things ultimately on Disney Plus pretty soon. So just uh, keep your eyes out on that. Uh, let's see, what other comments would we have here? Um, what this is telling me is that all the movies that were delayed, uh, oh, what this is telling me is that all the movies that were delayed still need filming or big editing done, uh, to the movies like Mulan, but movies like the, um, uh, but movie is like Sol Solar Black Widow, uh, they are getting delayed, all probably already finished and just need, uh, to air in theaters, but at least you could, uh, you, you heard from the directors of New Mutants at Comic-Con at home. The New Mutants will be released on August 20th, 2020. At least we have one summer blockbuster to look forward to. Eh, well, I guess you could say that. All right, so I'll go and read uh, one more comment before we're, we're going to jump on to uh, the next story. So <clears throat> uh, it says here, Not surprised about the film delays, but knowing the fact that some countries are handling the pandemic extremely poor, uh, poorly, what I'm more worried is what if the pandemic would last for longer than 2021? But I do have one small argument about the masks. I have no problem wearing a mask, but I know some people with a mental problem like cerebral palsy might have difficulty trying to wear them and it might be a small chance, but they might get a case of COVID. Well, I mean, like, it, it, the worst case scenario is that it is just putting on a cloth in their face. And if they can't wear it, then, like, they'll have someone uh, to go and help them out. I mean, it's as uh, simple as that. Now, I'm no expert on cerebral palsy and stuff like that. But, I mean, worst case scenario, uh, well, especially with the fact that someone with cerebral palsy, yeah, they would, they would have a stronger chance of getting COVID than they might not. So they're probably the kind of people that deserve to stay more at home for their own sake and for their own safety uh, than people who don't have it. So that, that's my response of that. So overall, um, the best thing you have to do, like the big moral lesson, folks, wear a freaking mask. I don't care how you feel about it. I don't care what condition you may make up uh, in terms of not so that you don't wear it. Just wear a mask or stay home. That's it. Oh boy, that was one big story right there. But now with that one done, it is now time that we are going to jump into another big story. And this is actually something that just happened um, as of yesterday of when I am recording this. It is a little bit strange on it, but it really does highlight something that is pretty big. That obviously, this is something that really does say that some people rather want to push their narrative more so than um, talking about facts or talking about the truth. And some people are just really desperate to push their narrative. And this is especially the case with the White House. Now, yesterday, um, they, uh, the White House had their, uh, press meeting that, you know, they had, uh, press secretary Kayleen, uh, Kayleen McEnany in which she would do her usual press briefings that mainly consist of lying to the press, uh, for the sake of just singing blind praises to Donald Trump. Now, of course, like it's stuff like that. That's very much common. It happens on a daily basis, but in this case, however, 
it's a little bit strange. It's a little bit peculiar because uh, McKinney, for some reason, decided to go on a little bit of a rant regarding cancel culture and dis and pretty much framing cancel culture as a massive enemy that one of the biggest problems of the world is with cancel culture and talking about how shows like cops and live pd has been canceled mainly because of recent events that have occurred but then she kept on continuing on about it and for some reason really went into a direction where some of the things are not true for the sake of antagonizing protesters. Well, you'll see what I mean, and I'm going to read from my source here on Deadline, in which uh, McKenney stated that Donald Trump is also appalled by cancel culture, and cancel culture is specifically, uh, and cancel culture specifically as it pertains to cops. We saw a few weeks ago that Paw Patrol, a cartoon show about cops, was canceled. The show Cops was canceled, Life PD was canceled, and Lego halted the sales of their Lego City police station. Now, yes, it is true that Cops got canceled, even though it was a very popular show that's been going on for several decades, and Live PD is another popular show that went on for a few, we uh, few years that ended up getting canceled. But what the fridge is the thing with Paw Patrol? For some reason, she decided to go and add Paw Patrol to the list. And that could not be further from the truth. And yes, McKenney lied to the press about it. Because the thing is, Paw Patrol did not get cancelled. In fact, Nickelodeon had to go on social media and directly address this by saying, no need to worry, Paw Patrol is not cancelled. And not just on the Nickelodeon account, but also on Nick Jr. and also on the Paw Patrol social media account to reassure people that it is not cancelled. In fact, it's kind of the opposite, where earlier this year, Paw Patrol actually got renewed for another season. And I believe um, in the next year, or maybe in a few years or something, they are planning to make a full-on legitimate Paw Patrol movie, like a full-on feature film that they want to go and release it in theaters, not just a small thing that would be out direct to DVD or direct to streaming services and stuff like that. And even on top of that, there was also the factor of uh, the Lego thing that apparently, oh, they stopped sales of Lego City police stations. That is not necessarily true. In fact, um, to read a little bit from my source uh, on Deadline, it states, Lego did not discontinue sales of cop-themed toys, but it did stop marketing efforts in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. So that's pretty much the big thing that, that that's currently going on is that for some reason, like, well, like knowingly or not, she flat out lied uh, regarding like the whole cancel culture pariah and saying that because of cancel culture, Paw Patrol ended up getting canceled, which is not true and kind of a weird lie to really go. Now, I know that technically... It is true that during the major hype of the Black Lives Matter movement this year, um, there were rumors that were speculating that maybe they would cancel Paw Patrol, mainly because of the fact that right out of the blue, uh, the companies that were running shows like Cops and Live PD decided to go and fully cancel it, so maybe the same fate would occur with Paw Patrol. But that was not really the case, because a lot of people who would go and bring that up, they would just do it for the sake of a joke, and that's it. Nothing fully serious. But I guess in this case here, McKenney either got confused and decided to put that in the pile, or she knowingly lied about it in order to push an anti-protest agenda. That could be the case either way. So really, it's the case that she couldn't even bother to do basic research and is just so bad at her job where she would just spew out misinformation in a very high position and a very important position, by the way, in a position where it should kind of be illegal to lie in the kind of job that you have or she knowingly is lying. She is just saying whatever she wants in order to go and push Donald Trump's agenda of making the protesters look bad, that somehow they are the evil ones because they resist the orders and they resist obeying Donald Trump and whatever he is saying. 
But the one thing that I really want to go and really highlight from all this, it's not really much of the political aspects. It's not even much about uh, Donald Trump or uh, Kayling McKenney. Like, yes, I, I mean, like, it is a, like, we might as well call it for what it is. It is a flat out lie, what they are stating with stuff like Paw Patrol. It might be considered like a little white lie, but still a lie nonetheless that is kind of, that is kind of dangerous to do in their positions. But what I really want to go and really focus on in this case is that this really does say a lot regarding cancel culture regarding uh the aspect of how people view cancel culture right now and how it is such a very controversial uh statement how it is kind of a controversial argument regarding cancel culture now one thing that i would like to go and emphasize like to, to really clear things off first and foremost is that i am very aware that cancel culture can be a very very flawed system especially in this day and age on the internet where most people there uh somehow act before they think or they speak before they think and they're pretty much demanding way too much way too quickly that someone has done something bad and they're immediately demanding someone to be canceled to immediately be wiped out from the face of the earth uh as punishment for their crimes and stuff like that like sometimes it can get out of hand pretty quickly and in, in itself can be a bit problematic however if there is one thing that is a lot more problematic than cancel culture itself it's the people who speak against cancel culture. You know the people who I'm talking about. The ones that have such a massive hatred, a massive grudge about cancel culture. Saying that cancel culture is the biggest problem in the world. Saying that cancel culture is the real fascism and stuff like that. Really emphasize, like really have a massive hatred for cancel culture. Those are the people that you should go and question more than cancel culture itself. Now, why am I saying this? Well, the reason why I say that, it's mainly because of the fact that when people heavily criticize cancel culture, it is not because they have an actual issue with cancel culture. It's not that they actually do have a problem with it. It's mainly because it's coming from shady people who have done some very questionable things and you can tell that they are very much desperate and are so afraid of being held accountable to their actions. And that's why you may, like the grand majority of the time, whenever you see someone speak out against cancel culture, it is mainly because they are desperate to go and avoid consequences to their actions and that they don't want to be held accountable for any of the wrongdoings that they have done or said. So they rather want to try to go and make themselves look like the victim to say that the people who called them out are more evil than the person doing the evil thing itself. Now, a great example of what I mean by this is if you go and take a look at J.K. Rowling. Now, you guys, of course, know J.K. Rowling, uh, the person that created Harry Potter, you know? Now, J.K. Rowling recently has gone through a lot of controversy recently. Like, 2020 really was the downfall of J.K. Rowling, mainly because she has done a lot of very questionable tweets regarding trans people. And in a way, kind of speaking out against trans people, not fully saying that they are the genders that they say that they are. Now, these are pretty questionable and controversial things to say, but she did receive some backlash. And this would have been something that could have been a massively easy fix. That This could have been an easy fix where all she could have done is just say, I was wrong for saying those things, I apologize, and that trans rights are human rights. Simple as that. She could have just said that, move on, and still would have been a highly admirable figure. But she decided not to do that. Instead, she decided to go and constantly double down on her statements. She refused to say that she was she is wrong, and she would go further down the rabbit hole to become more and more and more transphobic to the point that she would get immediately triggered 
when she would hear the words trans women are women. In fact, Stephen King actually said trans women are women uh, not long uh, after, not long after he would post uh, something where he made a little tweet praising J.K. Rowling's works and then said trans rights are human rights. And she decided that she would block J uh, Stephen King immediately. That apparently saying trans rights are human rights or that trans women are women was enough for her to get completely shook, to get completely frustrated, where she decided to immediately ban him. And instead of trying to own up to her mistakes, she even went even further and has joined in with a bunch of other authors as well to release this article speaking against cancel culture, saying that the real problem is cancel culture and stuff like that. And that did ignite the conversations of cancel culture and stuff. But in the long run, everyone knew, or at least the grand majority of people know, that the one who really is in the wrong is just J.K. Rowling, where she's just trying to use cancel culture as an excuse from avo to avoid uh, consequences to her actions. She's trying to avoid to apologize for the things that she has said in the past and for constantly doubling down on her transphobic point of views. So the big thing that I want to go and emphasize is that whenever people would speak out uh, about cancel culture, it's because they want to try to run away from their biggest fear. It's to be held accountable to their actions. And it's not just J.K. Rowling. You see plenty of examples of people like that. Because in this progressive day and age, more and more, we are viewing bigotry and discrimination as like a legitimate crime. That yeah, the police might not do anything about it but the public certainly will and we will flat out scold them for any form of racist misogynistic xenophobic or any form of discriminatory actions just based on someone's race on someone's sexuality on someone's gender uh, uh, someone's religion and many many more but these people refuse to believe that their bigoted mindset is the problem. And they view being apologetic as like some kind of weakness. And they have this toxic mentality that they want to try to avoid viewing, we viewing being weak at any time as possible. They don't want to be viewed as flawed. They want to be right all the time. And, that, and again, that is a very toxic mentality. And instead of blaming their bigoted ideologies, instead of saying that they're wrong, they would try to go and pin the blame on everything else, trying to make them look like the victim because they have been called out for their bigoted ideologies. This is why you see so many people on the internet speaking out not just against cancel culture, but trying so hard, like not only antagonizing and demonizing cancel culture, but that's also why you see many people demonizing feminism to, in order to protect their misogynistic views, in order to blame uh, social justice warriors, in order like cancel culture, social justice warriors, feminism, and, and all that kind of, you know, and blame leftists, fe uh, Democrats, liberals, and all that kind of stuff. They'd rather demonize people that they disagree with. They want to demonize the people that call them out on their bigotry instead of blaming the bigotry themselves. So what does this have to do with the story right here? Why is it that right now that the press secretary decided to go and demonize cancel culture in her press briefing? Well, that is mainly because of the subject of the recent protests that we are having, more specifically with the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, the big, like, if you want to know the big message of the Black Lives Matter movement, if, like, if I would point down, like, just a short summary of what the Black Lives Matter movement want, especially this year, after the events of George Floyd, is that people, the, the grand majority of the public, they all want the police to be held accountable for their actions. Because this is something that we have known for many years. We know that in the police force, there is this, mastic, uh, this massive systemic oppression going on. And this is like many forms of different oppression. Systemic uh, racism, systemic sexism, systemic xenophobia, and many, many more. We want police to be held accountable for stuff like that. And that there should be consequences to their actions Whenever they would do, whenever they would go and take something that would be way too far, especially when they would go after black people like George Floyd or Breonna Taylor and many, many more.
However, as we all know, Donald Trump is as racist as a freaking Klansman. And just like any person who is racist, he would side with the police instead of the Black Lives Matter movement. And he wants to do everything he can in order to make them look bad. Oh, and by the way, that I just realized right now, like when I was listing like uh, what people like the the people who are afraid of being held accountable to their actions like i list down like they would want to they would rather want to go and blame um you know social justice warriors on feminism on cancel culture they would also go antifa like antifa is also another massive one that they would rather blame that they would rather blame the actions of antifa than to blame their bigotry and this is the exact same case here uh especially with the government that instead of owning up that racism is bad that they would rather frame Antifa as somehow as the true villains. That people who are against fascism are the true bad guys of America or something like that. And as we all know, that when it comes to many of these protests, the grand majority of them are actually peaceful. Yes, we have seen so many of these clips of violence and stuff like that, but the grand majority of the violence that does happen, it's actually the police that would immediately ignite the violence. And yet there have been a few reports of the protesters themselves uh, really going out a little bit too far, causing not only violence, but also a bit of vandalism. But even at that though, the grand majority of them have been from Trump supporters that are against um, that are against the Black Lives Matter movement, mainly because of their racist tendencies, and they want to make them look bad by them causing violence and vandalism and stuff like that. By disguising themselves as a Black Lives Matter protester and trying to cause vandalism for the sake of making Black Lives Matter uh, the, the villains. But again... They are the grand majority of it, more than I would say 95% of the protesters from the Black Lives Matter movement are peaceful. Even the protests themselves are peaceful, the grand majority of them anyways. And you, you can pretty much tell, you probably have heard about the news about what, what has been happening in, Port, in Portland where uh, the Trump administration has unconstitutionally and debatably illegally has sent secret forces in order to use them, in order to use them as a fear tactic to kidnap protesters and lock them up because they were just protesting. Trump wants to go and stop people from protesting as a way to silence them, to, to put fear all around America to say, do not protest, because if you do, then you're going to get arrested. Especially if it's for a cause like the Black Lives Matter movement that speak out against systemic racism, which is kind of like the foundation of the Trump base, of like the Trump mentality, the Trumpism, if you will. And you can pretty much tell here that they don't care. And w with this case here, w with this narrative that the press secretary is trying to push out with uh, cancel culture and stuff like that, it's obvious that she cares so much more about trying to push a narrative to make the protesters look bad and to make the cops look good for the say, you know, for the name in the name of Donald Trump. That with can the, the thing is, like, they want to pin the blame on cancel culture, then systemic racism. They don't want cops to be held accountable for their racism. Tr Donald Trump wants to th wants white supremacy to thrive all around America, and so does every single person who supports him as well. They support if they support Trump, they also support white supremacy, and that's why they would go and side with cops because they. They support the cop that killed George Floyd instead of George Floyd. So in this case here, they don't care if they're lying. They don't care if the facts are not true and it's easy to go and search if stuff like Paw Patrol is canceled or if Lego stopped production on any Lego, poli Lego City police stations or anything like that. They're just desperate to push a racist narrative, to be unapologetic of the fact that they are racist because they are scared to be held accountable of their actions and they refuse to say that their racism is wrong so that's the big thing that i want to say again i know cancel culture can be a pretty flawed system and and, and sometimes it can be problematic but who is more problematic are the people like if there is one thing that's more problematic than cancel culture it's the people who call out against cancel culture because 
just like J.K. Rowling or even with the press secretary, they're not using cancel, they're not saying cancel culture is bad because they have a problem with it. They're trying to avoid accountability for their own bigoted mindset. And even at that, and one more thing I would like to add as well, that technically this, like the example she even brought up, this doesn't even apply to cancel culture in general. Because during the height of the Black Lives Matter movement, there wasn't really all that much people that were demanding for shows like Cops and Live PD to be cancelled. That was just something that just suddenly happened. That was ultimately deci the decision of the companies that made those shows. There wasn't a rally, like the point, the big point of Black Lives Matter movement wasn't to cancel Live PD or Cops. That was a decision by the companies themselves. It was their choice alone. So technically, this doesn't even apply to cancel culture. So I'm just going to call it call out Kayling McKenney McKenney that she doesn't even understand what cancel culture is. She doesn't know what this is. She just knows that it is a trigger word that only simple-minded people would act would like immediately activate like um to rephrase what I'm saying, I, I, I'm getting a little too ahead of myself, but she it's just that she knows that cancel culture is a trigger word that only simple-minded people would get all rallied up about it, that they would see the word cancel, someone bring up cancel culture in a negative way, and they would say, cancel culture bad, thing that caused cancel culture is bad, and cancel culture is bad, and we must stop it. So, that's basically the big thing that I want to go and emphasize. And I know this is a pretty uh, heavy-handed subject that I brought up, but, you know, honestly, if I could go and, like, cap off a bit on a, on a bit of a lighter note, like, I know it is pretty serious what I've been saying, but I'll, I'll just go and cap off uh, by, say, by making a little comment about Paw Patrol, that I will say that, yes, technically, it is true that Paw Patrol is not cancelled, but I, honestly, we should probably make some changes. You know, maybe Paw Patrol itself can stay, but that Chase guy has gotta go. And we know we got a perfect replacement for him. It's actually right here. Carl, the Antifa Rioter. You know, that, that would be a great replacement for Chase, wouldn't it? <laughs> all right, but I'll just uh, keep, in mind, keep in mind right now that this is all a joke, by the way. Uh, this is from the Babylon Bee, and this is, uh, uh, you know, this is a satirical article website in the similar veins of The Onion, and they, they decided to go and make this joke about Paw Patrol replacing Chase the Cop uh, with Carl the Antifa Rioter, and uh, what we see here is actually a picture of, basically, it's Chase, but his uniform is all red, and his shirt actually has Fidel Castro on it, and his hat actually has the uh, communism symbol, and he has, like, a special gun that shoots out bricks. Oh, and that's nothing. You should read about what it is. Like, if you got the time, you should read this article. It's actually very hilarious. It actually states right here, um, to describe a little bit about Carl the Antifa Rioter, If you see a store window that needs bashing in, just yelp for help, says Commissar, uh, says Commissar Rioter in every episode. Carl is on the case. No innocent bi no innocent business too big, nor commie too small. Carl will patrol the town and help citizens by bashing in windows, lighting things on fire, and punching Nazis. If he can't find a Nazi, he'll just punch the nearest person. <laughs> oh my god, and I'm, I'm like reading all this. It's actually hilarious, actually. <laughs> and, and they even mention, it's like, Carl is a great role model for your kids. He hates fascism and shows it by destroying things. <laughs> oh, God. Again, if you guys have the time to read this, it's, it's actually pretty hilarious. Uh, but yeah, so overall, guys, I hope you know what I'm talking about. But again, if there is a little bit of a moral to all this is that while cancel culture may not be perfect, the ones who are more problematic than cancel culture are the people who, uh, people who speak against cancel culture because there is a very strong chance that they just want to hold, they just want to avoid accountability for their own bigoted mindset and refuse to apologize and, if you, and refuse to admit to their mistakes. Okay, so... With that said, I would like to go into the chat wall, and I would like to know 
What do you think about all this? I would like to know your thoughts about the whole situation with what the press secretary has said and what she's trying to say with cancel culture and Paw Patrol. Let me know what you all think because this is honestly pretty crazy. Okay. Let's see. This is high evidence that the Trump administration is out of control. I'm not a Paw Person fan, my a Paw Patrol fan myself, but uh, this just flat out insane and proof that Trump and his cronies are just abusing their power. Pardon my French here, but si Trump, uh, si Trump était réélu à cette élection au lieu d'un candidat qui ça, uh, qui ça s'il fait, je vais être tellement furieux. I completely know what you mean. Write down in the comments if you know what he is saying. You can translate it all, but I'll just leave it at that for now. Okay. Uh, let's see. I don't think that Paw Patrol should be canceled, but she is just a liar and just wants attention. I don't think that it should be canceled because Chase uh, is the one to help people. And it's not like cops like Derek uh, Calvin, uh, 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 Def Chauvin, and her and her lying is not right at all. Canceling a kid's show is weird and should not go and lie about it. And you know, like, honestly, one weird thing that I gotta say as well with the, with the Paw Patrol thing is that technically not all the dogs are cops. Like, they're all supposed to be, like, rescue people, you know? Like, you got a fire... You got a firefighter. You got, like, a construction worker. You got um, a forest ranger and stuff like that. It's technically not all... It's not a show... In fact, it's not a cop show. It's not a cartoon cop show like McKennany is describing it. So, I don't know. So, really, it's like, it's kind of weird that she would also bring that up. And like I said, it's either she's doing a terrible job or she just, or she's just like flat out lying. Okay. Let's see. 2020 will now will be known as the year many reputations have died, including people at organizations like the Trump administration, Mr. Enter, Butch Hardman, the quartering, uh, Truder Maker, and those Smash Bros pedophiles. Okay, uh, time out of this. Um, honestly, I would have to go and disagree with you because I'll be very honest. 2020 is not the year that those people that their reputations have died. The Trump administration's reputation has been dead from the get-go. And the same thing with the quartering. Like, yes, it is true that nowadays more and more people are recognizing that the quartering is actually mentally ill and is a bit of a psychopath and YouTube needs to take action to completely delete his channel so that he would no longer monetize any of his hate speech. But the thing is that many of these people, like, not just that, but there's also Trump administration, quartering, Butch Hardman... Like those people, like those people already had their reputations dead in the first place. It's just 2020, it just made things worse. Like, yes, there are people like Mr. Enter and some of the Smash Bros players uh, that their reputations have pretty much been exposed and have really got, been going downhill on it. But many of the, but it's just that whenever their reputations are bad, in 2020, it's just like really going worse for them. Okay, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, do we have here? Uh, I'll just go. Uh, while I don't believe that Paw Patrol should be canceled, I do think that with a show being in a position that's in a really popular educational show, it has the chance to now reach the same level as Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers and make a nice episode addressing the topic about accountability. Of course, the show has a very innocent tone, so there is a chance that it can't be done or maybe it's already been done, but I guess we'll see. And you know, that actually does bring up a very good point, actually. You know, I would feel, you know, honestly, Paw Patrol should actually do something to actually go and address this that, you know, like, kind of like what Sesame Street has done, actually, they should go and actually commit to a full episode addressing the Black Lives Matter movement. What is it that the protesters are saying? And why is it that racism is a bad thing? And why systemic racism should be looked down upon and that it should be uh, something to look at where we ultimately would need a full-on police reform. You know, that, that would actually be a very good thing that Paw Patrol should do. Like, honestly, 
like Paw Patrol should take this moment and actually really take advantage to show their support of the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, we know that Nickelodeon has done a massive part in themselves uh, to really express their support for the Black Lives Matter movement. I think Paw Patrol should actually do so as well by committing to a full episode supporting the Black Lives Matter movement and showing, uh, teaching kids about the lesson about holding accountability and how systemic racism and racism in general is flat out wrong. All right, let's see what else do we got. A person working for Trump lying to people. What else is new? Yeah, I know what you mean, dude. Uh, next, you're going to say that the sky is blue. But seriously, cancel culture may not be perfect, but the goal is still that we want people to face consequences when they say or do something deeply offensive to other people or hurt people, may I add. Uh, why don't people understand that? Because egos are getting out of the way. That's the thing, though, is that they... No, the problem is that they don't understand that. It's that they do understand that. And they want to do their hardest to try to fight against it. Again, just take a look at people like J.K. Rowling and Butch Hardman as well. The, instead of going in the easy way... Instead of going in the easy way out in holding accountability and apologizing, they'd rather go into the hard way and dig themselves a deeper hole because they have way too much pride and have way too big of an ego to th for themselves. Like, seriously, they're not it's almost as if their narcissism is a little bit of a mental disorder and that it's just making things worse and worse and worse for them. Uh, let's see. What else do we got here? Um, what else? Uh, what other comment would I go and read? Uh, I saw an interesting one. Actually, yeah, I'll go and see this. Uh, at first of wondering why you're, you're talking about the story, but then you mentioned Paw Patrol. But the sad part is that Donald Trump actually believes in all these conspiracies and all these things. He's not technically lying to him because he actually believes this uh, to other Americans. They actually do believe this gets a confirmation from him and then creates another problem like the virus multiplying. I mean, Trump doesn't believe um, all, doesn't believe in the moon. Oh, he doesn't believe uh, about the moon landing and thinks that it is filmed a as like a Hollywood movie. I mean, yeah, there is, like there are plenty of those theories as well. I mean, like it's it, it's no secret that Donald Trump has um, uh, what is it called again? It's like frontal bipedal dementia or something. Like he has some form of dementia. You could tell that he is literally mentally ill. But it wouldn't like yeah, and it could be true that Donald Trump be legitimately believes in these infowar style crazy conspiracy theories, but. Then again, you never know. Like he is a mental Donald Trump is a mentally ill individual that is also a, a narcissist as well. It's also the personality that he has that he was being taught to be raised as as well. It's like a very dangerous combination that results in possibly the most toxic individual that you could ever imagine. Like the only other person that I can think of that has that kind of mentality and mental illness is just Kanye West, and that's it. Yeah, 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 and and another oh, there, there's also another thing that i want to mention but uh oh, man i kind of forgot about it uh, honestly oh actually there is also another thing is that there is also another theory as well that technically like with what you're seeing here uh what you're seeing here with the with the police with the po police force unconstitutionally attacking protesters in places like Portland and threatening to go and release other secret forces around the United States in major cities and stuff like that like another possible theory is that this is all nothing but a distraction there is a very strong chance that like, this is nothing but a distraction to forget about the fact that Donald Trump is doing such a terrible job with handling the coronavirus. So he wants to put his mind, like, he wants to occupy people's minds with something that is not even legal, that is full-on unconstitutional and fully morally wrong. This is a desperate, again, this is a desperate man who's trying to avoid accountability for one thing. And he knows for a fact that with the way that he is handling the coronavirus, it will immediately put him as the worst president in the United States of America in history and like one of the worst leaders ever where it should be illegal to support this person that anyone who support who supports Donald Trump should be ashamed of themselves and they should honestly like with the way that he's going well like you don't have to have a mental problem to support a guy like Donald Trump seriously man all right I'll go and read one more comment before we jump into the next story 
Uh, let's see here. <laughs> oh, what did Butch Hartman do? Well, let's be honest. What did Butch Hartman not do? <laughs> Um, this really is just insane. It really shows how people like Trump and Trump supporters are just nothing but a bunch of sheep. While cancel culture can be flawed, it does have its good points, and it really proves how these people just don't know what they are talking about. I am actually happy that Nickelodeon didn't cancel Paw Patrol since it is their most successful preschool show since Dora the Explorer and Blue's Clues. Absolutely, man. They just, absolutely, you just said it right there, man. Okay, whoo boy, well, that was certainly quite a mouthful and uh, one heck of a thing right over here. Now, we're gonna go and avoid some of the controversial topics and we're gonna jump onto uh, some of the more calmer animation news that we have right now, but don't worry, the fun is still going. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna be as long as some of the stories that I have talked about, but what we are gonna get into will be some interesting stuff over here, including a brand new series that's going to be coming out on Quibi called Fatha Mucka. And this is going to be a brand new series with Ryan Reynolds and Samuel Jackson. What is this uh, show going to be about? Well, apparently, according to the description here on my source on Variety, it seems like it's going to be just that. It's actually going to be a series with Ryan Reynolds and Samuel Jackson. If you don't believe me, um, I'll read you what, what it's about. Okay, so <clears throat> it says here, Samuel Jackson and Ryan Reynolds love each other. More accurately, Ryan loves Sam. When asked for comment on his feelings for Ryan, Sam said, tell them I couldn't be reached for comment. When a minor mishap causes Sam to become Ryan's primary caregiver, crap gets weird. Ryan is delighted to spend all of his time with Sam. Sam couldn't be reached for comment. So that's basically the plot. It's just, it's, it looks like a sitcom kind of show where Ryan Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson are living together, where Samuel L. Jackson seems like the straight man and Ryan Reynolds is the goofball. That's it. That's the main plot that we got. And in terms of um, who is going to be working on this, it is said that Father Mucka is actually created by Blockers writers Jim and Brian Kehoe, in which they are also going to be the story, uh, the showrunners and executive producers, along with uh, Ryan Reynolds and Samuel Jackson. And uh, apparently, they even got an animation studio working on it, where they got. Uh, uh, where, where is it? Uh, I almost lost it. Sorry. Uh, maximum eff effort. Uh, yeah. Maximum effort and tip mouse are going to be supplying the animations of this series. So that's basically the big idea of the show. It's the fact that we got Samuel Jackson and Ryan Reynolds and they're going to live together. And that's going to be the premise of this animated series. And that's it. Which I guess I can understand a little bit because when it comes to these two actors, they have been pretty renowned right now for their personalities. That mainly when you see them on the big screen, they're pretty much displaying not necessarily the character, but kind of their own charisma, their own charm. That the, the movies that you have seen, uh, it's pretty much seeing these characters in particular it's kind of rare that you would see a movie with ryan reynolds and samuel L. jackson and it's hard to not and it's and it's hard to actually see like a full-on character in themselves and just like you see more like their kind of personalities okay well maybe that's not necessarily true you know there are plenty of movies like especially with samuel L. jackson's case where um like he definitely does become like a completely different character but in many cases though when you see a movie with ryan reynolds you mainly see ryan reynolds when you see a movie with samuel L. jackson you mainly see samuel L. jackson and that and it, and it is especially the case with ryan reynolds where you would watch something like uh deadpool for example which really did launch his popularity where he would now become an A-list celebrity. And from there, like, he really kind of did adopt this Deadpool-style uh, personality, and he kind of put it onto several of his other movies as well. Like, even with uh, Detective Pikachu, like, even though he has been completely transformed into a Pikachu, you still see a lot of Ryan Reynolds in there, especially with his voice and especially with his charisma. And in the case of Samuel L. Jackson as well, 
Like, it's hard to not see the same kind of Samuel Jackson that you saw in Pulp Fiction and apply to plenty of the other features as well. It's like he's stuck, like he's pretty much perpetually stuck with that performance he delivered in Pulp Fiction and continue on other, uh, continue on like in plenty of other features. Sure, he has done uh, plenty of other films where he played as different characters, but when you see Samuel Jackson, or when when there's a movie with Samuel Jackson, he is. In, like, he does not blend in with the crowd. He truly does stand out with it. So, it's no secret that you could tell that this really is based on their personalities. It really is a show that heavily relies on just Ryan Reynolds and Samuel Jackson working together. And I mean, that combination has already worked before. We have actually seen that happen in the past, especially with the movie The Hitman's Bodyguard, which actually did become a pretty successful movie. I, I think it did actually get good reviews as well. So, you know, it is a popular, you know, it is a popular movie. People did enjoy it. In fact, like even for this uh, picture on, on the article, uh, well, this this article in Variety, like the picture that is shown is, um, is actually a shot from uh, the Hitman's Bodyguard in which that is kind of like the premise of the movie. There is like this action-packed story going on, but it mainly is like Ryan Reynolds hanging out with Samuel Jackson. In fact, next year, there's actually going to be a sequel called The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. However, with that said though, with all that said and done, even though they do have this major movie going on, even though like they are plan well not major movie but even though they want to have this series where they want to heavily sell on the idea of Ryan Reynolds and Samuel Jackson now I'm just going to say right now I do not trust this series 100% and that is mainly because of the streaming service that it is going to be released on Quibi now, I don't know about you, but I, I guess you could say I did get a little bit traumatized in the past when we saw that little trailer of your daily horoscope. You might remember that trailer. Uh, I showed it a few weeks ago in Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, and oh man, it is bad. It really did look like a cheap-looking BoJack Horseman ripoff. And it is kind of surprising considering that one of the executive producers of the show is actually Will Arnett. It's technically BoJack Horseman itself, uh, himself. And yet, the show itself just looks shameless. It looks very much bad. And it, very, and it looks low quality. Like, if it were just a little YouTube series uh, made by an independent artist, like, it wouldn't have received that much backlash uh, as it would right now. But the fact that this is coming from a major streaming... Like, this is coming from a streaming service, from a major Hollywood executive like Jeffrey Katzenberg, and it's being produced by Will Arnett, and uh, I believe another major company that's also attached to it, it's just, it looks bad. It really did. So honestly, it kind of ruined my taste for whatever animated content that would come out on Quibi. And even with this, like, yeah, they, they do have some pretty credible actors as well. And they do have some credible animation studios that are working on it as well, like Maximum Effort and Titmouse. But overall, I just don't really trust any of this, honestly. The fact that it is from Quibi, it's just, it, it's something that like kind of, completely taken away my interest like if it were released onto something like netflix or something like that then it would seem intriguing then i would feel more open to this series and that maybe it could turn out good maybe it can have some substance into it but the fact that it is from quibi it really does give me a lot of doubt and like i'm not i'm not going to be subscribing to quibi anytime soon so i'm definitely not going to be watching it but then again uh, of course I could be wrong. This could actually turn out to be a fantastic series. Maybe, like, the chemistry with Ryan Reynolds and Samuel Jackson could actually work out in this. But overall, I'm just not really down for this idea. So, uh, we don't necessarily have a release date for uh, for the Mucka, but honestly... It's just, I, I don't know if it's, I'm just going to say right now, I don't even know if it's even going to happen. Like, the thing is, what by the time it would be ready, would Queepy still be alive? Like, that's probably the one thing people are more surprised about, is the fact that Queepy is still around trying to be a streaming service and not, like, dead in the water. That That's kind of the shocking thing about this. So, I don't know, I guess we'll have to wait and see. 
But overall, though, um, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you guys, what are your thoughts on Fathomaka? Is this a series that you would be interested in checking out? Would you, Are you open to the idea of an animated show with Ryan Reynolds or Samuel Jackson being Ryan Reynolds or Samuel uh, and Samuel Jackson? Or is this just overall a pretty bad idea? Let me know what you think, folks. Okay. This sounds like a really fun idea, but still not on board with Queeby's business model, but I do hope they can get Martha Stewart, Jimmy Kimmel, Brie Larson, and Magic Johnson. That would be funny, uh, that would be so funny ironic with all the running gags uh, they have together uh, in the real life. Eh, you never know, man, and I mean, like, with a show, like, with people like them involved, they could actually make that happen. Uh, let's see. As much as I like both Ryan Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson, I don't really trust Queeby with animation after your daily horoscope. Or really at all, because I, I, because need I remind you of Anna Kendrick going on a road trip with a talking sex doll. But if it turns out to be good, I'll probably check it out. However, um, if it does get bad reviews, um, I just hope there's just one there's just a uh, one one person with a picture with a lightsaber reading "Bad for the Mucka." <laughs> uh, I get what you mean there, dude. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm honestly not interested. I'm not even interested in Queeby ever since that Your Daily Horoscope trailer. I'm just going to stick with uh, animated show with uh, other animated shows and movies. Okay, fair enough, dude. It really, you know, honestly, it really is the Queeby factor that's just a massive turnoff. You know, it remind you know, it's kind of like that Squidward meme in a way, where like you got Squidward coming in with his lawn chair. It's like, ooh, an animated series with Ryan Reynolds and Samuel Jackson, and then it's like you see him like just unenthusiastically leaving and it's like oh it's gonna be on queeby well screw this then <laughs> seriously like like the queeby name seems to be a massive turnoff now how ironic is that um let's see now this is probably a dumb question but how many of us are going to bet this show will be referenced um to at least one samuel uh, one of samuel or ryan's movies i can already hear jokes with the title like English for the mucka, do you speak it? Uh, and I have, uh, I, I have had it with these Father Muckin snakes on this Father Muckin plane. But seriously, even if I am interested in seeing this show, Queeby really needs to fix himself. Even if I am interested in seeing some of the show, uh, like the revival of uh, Legend of the Hidden Temple. Yeah, I mean, oh no, I think honestly that's going to be a guaranteed. If it is just going to be a show with Ryan Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson, of course they're going to make references to their movies. You know that's going to be happening. Um... Let's see now. Um, I'm very, uh, I'm very interested to see how this show goes. It's an interesting concept and very talented actors, but since it's coming on Queeby, it might make me a bit worried. Also, speaking of Jeffrey Katzenberg, uh, has really passed his prime. And am I the only one who thinks of the Wilsonator's voice as Jeffrey Katzenberg ever since Animation Look Back Disney Studios Plus? Oh man, the, the Wilstonator. I gotta say, if there is one man who knows how to even overshadow uh, Logan's animations and animation look back, it's the Wilstonator. Especially with uh, with Part Eight. Oh my God, he truly was the star of those animated moments. Like you really gotta give that guy some credit. If you wanna see more of his stuff, I believe he has a, a YouTube channel. I know he has a Twitter account, but Definitely go check out the Wilsonator. He like his voiceover work is just incredible, and I could not thank him enough for his performances on Animation Look Back. And who knows, maybe if if Jeffrey Katzenberg keeps appearing in my stories, um, and, and keeps appearing in the history, then maybe I can bring him on more. Who knows? We'll see. Um, but only the history could tell. Uh, <clears throat> all right, I'm gonna go and read one more comment before we're gonna jump into the next story. Uh, let's see. Uh, even though I haven't seen Hitman's Bodyguard, but Turbo, uh, techno but Turbo technically, I would be down for it if not on Queeby. Um, I, I would be okay with Netflix or Prime Video, but not Queeby. Uh, the only thing that I heard that's keeping Queeby, uh, alive is Kevin Hart, uh, is the Kevin Hart drawn Travolta show or movie I think is, uh, Die Hard, so there's that. Uh, don't know if Queeby will be around, but if it is, I wouldn't subscribe to it. 
Yeah, then again, the real question is, find someone who would be willing to actually go and subscribe to it and stick to it. All right, so for the next story, we are going to be looking ahead into the future. And what we are going to see is going to be the debut of a brand new animation studio. Now, we have heard about this one in the past, but it seems that now they are set and ready to really make their debut in 2022. And who I'm going to be talking about is going to be Skydance. Yes, Paramount and Skydance Animation has announced their big plan for their debut in 2022 where they're going to be releasing not one but two animated features for that year. Now I know I have already stated in this episode that they do have another film that's going to be scheduled for 2023 with The Tiger's Apprentice, but so far we got plenty of other features that they are hyping themselves up with. Uh, the first one will be called Luck, in which it will be directed by Peggy Holmes, the same person who directed some of the uh, Tinkerbell directed DVD movies like Secret of the Wings and The Pirate Fairy. And reading from my source here on Animation Magazine, it states that Luck features the unluckiest girl alive who stumbles upon the never-before-seen world of good and bad luck and must join with magical creatures to uncover a force more powerful than even luck itself. But then, there is the second movie. Their second feature is the biggest one that they are advertising, and this is going to be the one that they are hoping that it will make their grand entrance onto the animation feature competition. And what I'm talking about is going to be regarding Spellbound. Oh, and by the way, before I, I continue to Spellbound, uh, I just want to mention with Luck, they have revealed that it's going. that film is actually going to be released on February 18th, 2022. But anyways, back to Spellbound. The biggest thing that they are hyping up about uh, with Spellbound is not necessarily the story itself because they didn't necessarily say much about it. It only states that apparently Spellbound... Um, is just a movie where it's set in a world of magic where a young girl must break the spell that has split her kingdom in two. But rather, they actually got some major names that are going to be working on this. Some very reputable names even that will be working on this feature. In fact, uh, the people who are leading this are actually uh, a duo from Shrek actually. We got one of the directors of Shrek, where we got Vicky Jensen as the director, and we also got a Shrek producer that will be producing this with David Lipman. And in terms of the script, uh, they actually got a bunch of people uh, working on this. They got a couple of writers from the Mulan remake with Lauren Hynek and Elizabeth Martin, and they even brought on board Liv Linda Wolverton, whom you may know recently has been writing films such as uh, the Maleficent movies and the recent Alice in Wonderland films, but in the past she was a writer for several of the big Disney movies during the Disney Renaissance like Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King. Uh, but then there are the musicians, the people that are going to be working on the songs because this is technically an animated musical and who they got on board are some of the biggest names in animated musicals. They actually got Alan Menken on board to go and compose the music of it as well as getting Glenn Slater to add in music, to add in lyrics to the songs. Now, Alan Menken, I think it is safe to say we all know who that guy is, the legendary composer uh, who has worked on many beloved Disney features like The Little Mermaid, The Lion uh, not The Lion King, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Pocahontas, Hercules, uh, and uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, and many, many, many more. And then we also got Glenn Slater nominated for several awards and also being the lyricist of Tangled on top of having Chris Montan as an executive music producer. And for that film, they have managed to get a schedule. Uh, they are planning to have it be released on November 11th, 2022. <sighs> Sorry, I just need to clear my throat a little bit. Okay. Now, with all this said... I think it really does go to show that, yeah, with the with the first film with luck, 
yeah, it's going to be, you know, it's just going to be there. But you, you could tell that they are really hyping up Spellbound. They know that with the people that are attached, that this is going to be massively anticipated, that they got several big names, several powerhouses collaborating together to make this one major motion picture. Like, we got some major people uh, including, like, we got some big people, including, like, people who worked on Shrek, uh, people who worked on the Disney Renaissance, and, uh, people from Disney, like, nowadays, and all that kind of stuff, like, they really are hyping that up to make their big debut. I mean, technically, Luck would be their debut, per se, but to really make their grand entrance, to really show that they are a massive competitor in the animation field, to truly make their entrance in the hopes that they could come in just like Illumination Entertainment coming out big, coming out strong, they're going to use Spellbound, especially with the big names that are all attached to it, in order to make this massive animated musical fantasy that could probably be in the same ranks as like the films made by Disney and DreamWorks as well. In fact, uh, there is also one more thing I almost forgot to, to read, and that is a, a quote from the president of Skydance Animation, Holly Edwards, where it states here, Luck and Spellbound create rich worlds and compelling characters that we know will resonate with audiences everywhere. It is incredibly exciting to see that our team of legendary creatives working around the clock and across the globe to bring these features to life. And that is essentially the big marketing strategy that they want to do to really make Skydance Animation a powerful force to be reckoned with. To really show that they are capable of bringing in some big names and some massively credited filmmakers like people who worked on Shrek and legendary Disney musicians working on this film that they are able to get those people to do those movies and that they don't just work in places like DreamWorks or Disney or anything like that and if the car like if the cards are in their favor if they do play this right then I do believe they can actually make this um, actually possible. They could actually come in and actually enter as a massive powerhouse in the animation industry and actually put Paramount back as a serious competitor in the animation field like, uh, like how they were um, when they were distributing DreamWorks movies. However... There is one big but about all this, and this is actually something that I see the chat wall is flooding the comments with this. Like, this is something that ever since I started this story, people are just constantly asking and asking and asking about this. It's like, yeah, it's great that you got people like Vicky Jensen on board. It's great that you got Alan Menken and Glenn Slater and Chris, Mo Chris Montan and Linda Wolverton and David Lipman on board. But there is the massive white elephant in the room that it is not addressing, nor do we see much articles actually addressing about this. John Lasseter. What about him? Because we all know about the history with John Lasseter and what has recently happened with him. And I mean, like, in the animation industry, the most powerful person in animation that was hit by the hashtag MeToo movement was John Lasseter. Pretty much exposing not only uh, some of the uh, sexual misconducts that he has done with the women at Pixar, but also establishing Pixar animation as a bit of a boys club kind of uh, uh, studio. Where it has, like, we have seen recently where it has been revealed that there is kind of this systemic racism and systemic systemic misogyny that kind of corrupted the company many years ago or at least during uh John Lasseter's reign as chief creative officer and even though we haven't heard any form of reports about John Lasseter or we have heard anything about John Lasseter since then we like we don't know if things are getting better or if things are pretty bad at Skydance as well where that boys club mentality is at that place and inevitably this is something that they cannot solve by just you know that that, that they would just go and just um that 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 I lost my train of thought sorry about that this, this is not something that they could just hide in and pretend that you know not like that it's not an issue at all they they, they can't just pretend that 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 the factor that they have John Lasseter being one of the big heads in the studio be something that 
they can't they can't mention that they can't say at all it, it, like i said it's a white elephant in the room they need to go and address this at some point they need to go and bring this up regarding john lassiter because it's kind of like the awkward situation like would you want to like would people legitimately want to go and support a movie knowing that one of the big heads that are behind it is probably the animation equivalent of like harvey weinstein or something okay well maybe it's a bit extreme to compare him to harvey weinstein because it is true that what john lasseter has done is not as extreme as what harvey weinstein has done but in terms of the power that he had back then like at the point where he was once considered one he was considered the most powerful person in the animation industry like there is that comparison that is a little bit fair they need to go like eventually i feel like they would have to go and address this otherwise it would really it would just really um fall flat in their face they would end up receiving massive backlash because if they're not going to address it then social media certainly will you know that there are going to be people that will address this you know people ha did not forget about the fact that skydance animation has john lassiter and if they're not going to bring up the issue then honestly it could really fall flat in their face then at that point it's not going to matter who they got for their movies because they know they had john lassiter in a way some people could say that they are the reason why john lassiter did not face much consequences to his past actions because at the most john lassiter just just jumped from one animation studio to the next and still being the head of a a, a major animation studio that's pretty much the big thing that is currently going on with all of this so overall they i feel like inevitably they have to go and address the issue with john lassiter they need to go and bring this up if he has improved if he has learned from his past mistakes and stuff like that they can't just sweep it under the, under the rug and just pretend like oh we're gonna come in big and we're gonna get we're gonna be releasing movies with uh with uh vicky jensen and alan menken working on it at that point people are not really gonna care because there is the big problematic person that is kind of like the head of not just those movies but like the entire studio so it's the, like this is not a situation that they can't be like channel awesome and just like pretend it doesn't exist and just go on from there and just hope that people are gonna forget about it and they'll all move on eventually this is a situation that they really have to get that, that honestly they need to address this eventually they will have to be in the spotlight and they will have to address having John Lasseter on board and how he is doing nowadays. Because otherwise, what? Otherwise, it's just going to receive backlash. At that point, it's not going to matter who they bring on board. People are not going to be supporting a movie that will have someone who was severe, so severely crushed by the hashtag MeToo movement with more than enough evidence proving that he was definitely in the wrong in this. So that's the thing. They, it's not really the case about Skydance. It really is the case about John Lasseter. And people don't want to support John Lasseter. And ultimately, they will not go and support the movies. So sooner or later, they will have to go and address it. Maybe not this. Maybe not. Uh, maybe not anytime soon because their release, their movies are going to be coming out in 2022. But eventually, they'll have to. And I, I don't know. Like it, it's like I will give it that. Stuff like Spellbound and Luck may have their promise, but if 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 they're not going to bring up the the situation with John Lasseter, then honestly, I I, I don't know. It's just not gonna go. I, I can guarantee you, it's not gonna go well for Skynance for sure. Okay, so with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall, and now I want to pass it on to you. I would like to know, you guys. How do you feel about Luck and Spellbound? Is it something that you would be interested in checking out? Or is the factor of John Lasseter making it really too iffy? I want to know what you think on this. Okay. Now, let's see now. 
Um, I, um, I'll be fair. These films do have some decent ideas. Spellbound in particular sounds like a pretty good movie, and I could probably see it becoming a bit of an award competitor. I won't be trusting John Lasseter anytime soon, but I wish the uh, I wish them the best with their fruits of their labor. Also, regarding the Channel Awesome statement, they did address it. They just said, "Yeah, sorry you feel about yeah, sorry you feel that way, but wanna watch us dis." <laughs> you want to watch us desecrate Pink Floyd? Yeah, okay, so, yeah, it is true. They did address it, but holy crap, was that much of a disaster and making things worse for them. We're sorry you feel that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, okay, let's see what else do we got here. But you, you do actually do bring up a very good point, because if you look past the whole John Lasseter aspect, like, these ideas, they don't actually sound pretty bad. In fact, I will say it is actually very promising with the people that they brought on board with Spellbound, and even with Luck, it does sound like a pretty intriguing idea. You know, like, I, under normal circumstances, I would be pretty open to this. I would actually be pretty on board and be pretty excited to hear, like, uh, some new songs coming from the team that did Tangled, uh, or at least did the songs of Tangled, but it's just... You know, it's kind of like with the last story that I talked about with uh, with the Ryan Reynolds and uh, w w and the Samuel Jackson story with the with the show that they got. You know, with the Ryan and Sam story that does sound pretty interesting. And under normal circumstances, I'm sure it would have a lot of appeal. There's just that one little thing that's keeping us away from being fully invested in it, regardless if it's Queeby or if it's John Lasseter. I, I, you know, it's only now that I realize that there is a connection between these two stories. Uh, let's see. Luck and Spellbound sound interesting in terms of both plot and the people involved in those projects, but I still don't know if I can trust Skydance Animation considering that John Lasseter is still at the helm and could s and it could still backfire in terms of reputation in the future. Also, not to, not to get off topic, but on the side, I saw Robo Splat from the infamous logo and just a few minutes ago Regis Philbin has passed what what Regis Phil no oh what Regis Philbin is dead oh oh dude are you kidding me oh that that sucks man I love Regis oh that is yeah oh, man real man that sucks that's really unfortunate. I loved him in, uh, I remember when I was a kid, I, I, I loved watching Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Aw, oh, man, that is, man, that's, that is not a great time to hear about that. Wow, that, that really did suck. Aw, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a bit depressing. Aw, oh, man, that, that, that sucks. Okay. Anyways. Um, well, well, a new animation studio on the rise. I'm pretty interested to see what this new studio can do. I'm interested in Spellbound. I'm pretty open for the movie Luck. Who knows? Uh, this could possibly become the greatest rival in animation. Oh, and also, about John should do something about that. Uh, the scar is still there, and it's something nobody or John can fix and heal other than to improve. And yeah, you, like I said, you're definitely right on that. They, these projects do have a lot of promise. But if they don't address the issue about John Lasseter, then none of this will really matter. Because people ain't gonna support someone like John Lasseter. It's nothing against spell it's nothing against Skydance Animation. It's nothing against the project themselves. It's just they don't want to support someone uh who really made a toxic environment out of Pixar. Okay. Uh anyways, uh let's see what else we got here. Um while the movie, while the while this movie has potential with a lot of talented people, I feel like they don't. Uh, I feel uh, they don't address the issue with John Lasseter. It will absolutely bite them in the butt, similar to what happened with the Channel Awesome controversy. Case in point: Nostalgia Critics review with the Wall. Well, I mean, with the Nostalgia Critics the Wall review, it's not really because of Change the Channel that really screwed them over. Like the Wall review is mainly because of the fact that. It was just a very poorly done review. It was just like, it, it's one of those extremely rare cases where something got a massive amount of backlash, not because of anything it said or not because of um, any bigoted thing it addressed. It's just because it was a really poorly made review. It, it was only that. Um, let's see, what else do we got here? Uh, did I read this one? Oh, right. Oh, okay, this one. Actually, I I think I'll make this one. Um, 
I'll, I'll make this one the final of uh, the final one before we jump into the next story. Look sounds just, uh, look, so look, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't speak. Look sounds just decent, but spell down, uh, Spellbound does certainly seem impressive with all of the people working on it. Um, if there is something that will hinder them right now, it's going to be John Lasseter. I could certainly see people avoiding these movies because of all the, the, the misconduct he has done. Uh, we even see that John is never mentioned at all in this article. We, we do already know that Emma Thompson left Luck after jo Lasseter joined Skydance. We just have to see if Skydance will address this or not. At this rate, it doesn't seem like they are, but uh, I don't know, man. Eventually, they'll have to. They have no choice. But like I said, all these have promise. The people that are involved have a lot of promise. The movies themselves have a lot of promise, resulting in Skydance Animation to have a very strong debut in 2022. They have a lot of potential. But if they don't address the issue of John Lasseter, None of that is going to matter. <clears throat> okay, so with that said, it is now time we are going to jump into the grand finale. <coughs> oh, fudge. <coughs> ah, crap, I got in the wrong hole. All right. <coughs> Whoa! Sorry about that, folks, but okay, yes. Now, um... No, one thing that I want to mention for this grand finale, um, yeah, kind of a bad timing about the mention that Regis Philbin has fat. <laughs> go wash your <laughs> wow already like people are freaking out in the in the chat wall. Go wash your hands, Animat. I will after this podcast. I promise. <laughs> okay, but in all seriousness, though, it really is kind of bad timing about the mention that Regis Philbin has unfortunately passed away because usually when i would go and talk about um people's legacy and people's lives and stuff like that it usually is related to a death and what i want to do here is um uh, like the thing is what i want to do for this is that i want to go into the opposite route i want to end things off on a lighter note after all the controversial discussions that we have here in this episode because uh, the big thing about all this is that um, what I'm about? What I am about to talk about is um, it's not going to be someone's death, but rather someone's life. More specifically, uh, someone who has been living right now for about a hundred and ten years, and who I'm talking about is Ruthie Thompson. And it is true, folks, that this week she has been turned. She actually turned. 110 years old and you might be wondering who is ruthie thompson who is this individual that has been living for so long well it is said here that she is actually a disney animation pioneer but more specifically she has been with disney ever since the very beginning of the company like she legit knew walt and roy disney even before they were massively big with their company, even before Walt Disney created Mickey Mouse. And I'm going to go and uh, read from this article here in The Hollywood Reporter that is a little short summary about her legacy at Disney. <clears throat> now, it states here, Born in 1910 in Portland, Maine... Uh, in Portland... Sorry, let me redo that. Born in 1910 in Portland, Maine, Thompson moved with her family to Los Angeles when she was eight. They took up residence down the street from Walt and Roy Disney, who were, uh, who were then beginning their namesake studio out of their uncle's garage. Thompson recalls sitting on an apple box beside them until she'd be told to go home for dinner. Years later, she was hired, a pioneering woman at the company and in her field. She first joined the ink and paint department during the next four decades. Thompson worked in various capacities, including reviewing animation cells before they were filmed and scene planning on films. Uh, oh, and scene pl and uh, scene planning on films such as Fantasia, Dumbo, Sleeping Beauty, and Mary Poppins. Now, when asked about, <clears throat> oh man, oh, fudge. I need to go and try to work with my system. Okay, anyways, I'm all cleared out. As I was saying, 
Uh, the amazing now, of course, like as someone who has lived 110 years old, it also comes with the obvious question about um, how do you manage to live for so long? And uh, she would go and actually respond here uh, just to read you uh, what she stated. It's because I'm a vampire. How can I tell you my secret? Because then it won't be a secret. I'm a dummy for living this long. <laughs> but in, uh, then uh, she actually made the subject a bit more serious. I don't know why I am still here, but I know that I don't want to be revered for how old I am. I want to be known for who I am. And then when she would ask for a piece of wisdom, it's like what you should do uh, in terms of like living and in terms of like, you know, what's the best way to live life. And she just stated, have fun. Try to do as much as you can for yourself. Remember all the good things in life. And, uh, you know, the amazing thing about the fact that she is now 110 years old is actually regarding the fact that, uh, believe it or not, this quarantine right now, this pandemic, this coronavirus, it is not her first global pandemic that she experienced. She is actually old enough to look at the coronavirus and say, been there, done that, mainly because of the fact that in her youth, when she was like eight years old, she actually went through the Spanish flu when that was a massive uh, global pandemic happening all around the world. And, uh... On top of that, they also went into several different factors, and she is actually going around and actually helping out with this uh, current pandemic er, er, uh, right now, where it e even this article actually starts out by saying that Ruthie Thompson, a longtime Disney animation supervisor and now the oldest resident at the Motion Picture and Television Fund's country house and hospital, turns 110 in COVID-19 quarantine on Wednesday. She's celebrating by attempting to raise $110,000 in support of a post-production suite at the Woodland Hills campus in-house television and video facility where she and other retirees have spent countless hours continuing to pursue their industry crafts. So she, you know, it's very nice of her that she's uh, doing this fundraiser. And also, one thing that uh, is also very highlighted, not only is she very well known uh, for her legacy at Disney, which by the way, yes, she has been uh, inducted as a uh, Disney legend back in 2000, but she is also very well known to be a LA Dodgers fan. Uh, I believe the I, I believe uh, the Dodgers are Los Angeles, but uh, I don't know much about baseball. I do apologize on that. I'm Canadian. I'm more into hockey. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, she even responded that the first thing that she wants to do when the lockdown is over, when the coronavirus is getting better in the United States and around the world, she knows that the first thing that she wants to do is to go see. She actually says. I can't wait to watch my Dodgers and eat a Dodgers dog. <laughs> so you could definitely tell that even at 110 that she still has her sense of humor. She still has a very strong personality. And it's actually amazing to see many of the in many of the images uh, that are related to Ruthie Thompson and where she would work. Like here she is like you know this is her job at Disney where she is and still at a pretty old age there. And then, like, you got this image of a very young Ruthie Thompson next to a young Walt Disney. Like, if I could judge, like, when this time period would be, like, I, if I would take a guess, this looks like this was taken probably during the production of, like, Snow White or even uh, Pinocchio, I would say. I don't know. I have seen Walt with this shirt before. And even, like, here she is, like, next to her Disney legend plaque uh, that is right in front of the Disney animation building. And even, like... This is her now, and this is like her nowadays, or like from a few years ago. This is apparently taken during during an event in 2014, but wow, this is honestly amazing. And yeah, like, like she stated, uh, she doesn't want to be remembered for her age specifically, but rather she wants to be remembered for who she is and with her legacy working at Disney. And it's honestly kind of shocking that someone like her is still alive. Not only someone who has known Walt Disney, like even before he created Mickey Mouse and Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, but also as someone who actually did work at the Hyperion Studio, the place where it is actually said to be like the Garden of Eden of animation, like a big once upon a time 
time that was considered like an animator's true paradise uh, back in Disney's heyday, back like in the 1930s and stuff like that. It's amazing that someone is actually still alive and could actually tell the tales of uh, her experience working at Disney. Now, technically, uh, from what I have read, she didn't work at Disney for like all her life and stuff like that. She did retire after working on The Rescuers, I believe. Uh, but still, it's amazing to see a significant player who has touched upon many of these classic movies that is still alive to this day and still giving out uh, great advice and still, you know, spreading joy and having a lot of fun as well. And honestly, I highly recommend that you go and read this article or read more about Ruthie Thompson and the legacy that she has because she seems like a very fun person to interact with. It's like, you, you, you know, someone that you would wish you would actually go and meet. Like if you would ever go one day to like the D23 Expo when things are getting better, like hopefully you would meet Ruthie Thompson and I'm sure she would be like a blast to hang out and a blast to have a chat with. And, and you know, like honestly, it was the, it, like out of all the art articles that we had this week, this is the one that I find myself laughing the most and like just so fascinated about this woman and even even like telling like even like talking about like the stories of how she's handling during these times and stuff like that is that um often she would go and talk on the phone and sometimes she wants to visit neighbors and people would keep telling her distance Ruthie distance <laughs> and, and, and especially with how she is like a major Dodgers fan and stuff like that and even like um with the with the residence uh, CEO Bob uh, Bacher, like she would often have arguments because Bob is actually not a fan of the Dodgers and she loves the Dodgers. So you could see the interesting chemistry that's going on right there. Uh, but it is truly fascinating to see, um, especially with a legend like her, because we don't often talk about female Disney legends. And with someone like her, who has worked on the ink and paint department for so long and has touched upon many different Disney movies to make sure that they could be the best that they could be. And honestly, like in terms of the ink and paint aspect with uh, the final look of the feature, you can pretty much see Like you can literally see the impact that she had in many of those features with how they look to make sure that the colors are right, to make sure that the cells are clean, that she was responsible for those. So with, uh, with the way that Disney animation for so long, with how the classics look so clean and so, cr uh, so crisp uh, with the cells and stuff, you can thank Ruthie for that. She truly is is an artist with those cells so with all that said and done this really like i i, I don't know if there really is a whole lot uh, to go and talk about with ruthie but Again, I highly recommend you to go and read about Ruthie Thompson. Uh, definitely quite a character, quite a personality. And I just want to say a uh, happy 110th birthday, Ruthie. Um, it really is phenomenal that you have lived this long. But most importantly, that you have such an amazing legacy uh, with uh, Disney and maybe with, uh, with, with the Dodgers as well, being a massive Dodgers fan. So um, hopefully you will still live, live many years to come to tell your story stories and um you, you know and just uh you too like uh, you know you wish us to have fun and we hope you uh have fun as well and hopefully one day you will get back to seeing the dodgers and have that dodgers dog Okay, so with that said, I'd like to go into the chat wall, and uh, do you guys have any words you would like to express with uh, Ruthie Thompson, or any questions you would like to ask about uh, Ruthie Thompson? Uh, anything you would like to say about the uh, 110th birthday of Ruthie right over here? It's about time that we could talk about someone's legacy and someone's life, and it's like, it's not about someone's death, that, you know, it's great that we actually s still have someone like Ruthie still alive, today even! Oh, uh, let's see now. All right. She is someone that you need to interview right away. And the work she has uh, will be remembered for years to come. I do know that one of her uh, Sword of the Sword drawings went to big money at an auction for cancer charity. So congrats to her uh, entire legacy. And you'll be remembered for years to come. Absolutely, dude. Uh, let's see. So nice to see another animator over 100, and 100 years old. And to hear stories uh, about what it's like to live for over a century. I hope there are, uh, I hope there are more animators and animation historians
experience about 100 years old or older uh, who have had the experience in the industry and perhaps be one of the many inspirations for more people out there who want to get into the animation business. She could definitely be served as a great inspiration and like I would like to see her talk more to the public or or hell, make make freaking vlogs. Have I want to see? I would be so down for a Ruthie Thompson YouTube channel. Just her talking about her stories, talking about her experience with Disney, and talking about how, how what it's like working in the ink and paint department and working with animation cells and stuff. I would be so down to watch that. That would be amazing. All right, let's see now. Wow, Ruthie seems like a fun person and does certainly seem like an important person for Walt Disney Animation. I will certainly read this article later. Also, I just found a YouTube video uh, made by Pogi Joe where she talks about the making of Snow White. Ooh, that does sound interesting, so uh, definitely go and check that out. Uh, what a surprise. A woman who lives so much longer who, who previously worked at Disney. I'll definitely be interested in knowing her history at Disney. Absolutely. Um... This woman truly is an admirable person. This is a woman who has met Walt Disney himself, and I truly believe she will go down in history because of her time with Disney. <laughs> I mean, like, she has already made that. I, I think she has already put that, that, that moment. Like, she has already made that mark in Disney history. It's just amazing to see her keep on going. Uh, let's see. I never heard of Rufy Thompson, but some, but someone insane is reaching... A uh, very old age, like uh, Richard Overton, the World War II veteran, and that's how it goes. Oh, okay. Oh, Sword in the Stone, not Sword in the... Oh, oh, did I say Sword in the Sword? Okay, sorry, it's Sword in the Stone, of course, of course. Okay, <laughs> alright, so there is that. Uh, I'll read one more comment here. Anyone else would like to say something? Uh, I wish you a happy birthday, Ruthie Thompson, and hope you live for many more years to come. Alright, that does seem uh, pretty, pretty good to cap this off. So with that said, that will be it for this massive episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. And wow, what an amazing episode we have had. So that was a pretty insane one, but I am glad that we went through this entire ride all together. So I would like to go and say thank you all so much for watching. Thank you all so much for which. Uh, for, for, thank you all so much for listening, and tune in next week for more crazy stories to come in this podcast. So I would like to say once again, thank you all so much for watching. Thank you all so much for listening, and until next time, see you later, dudes. Thank you.